so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and today we'll be cooking pseudo labels. A couple of words about me. Uh, I am a Kaggle competition Scrum Master located in Minsk, Belarus. Uh, my name at Kaggle is b.e.s. And currently I work as a data scientist at H2O. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, some distinctions between labeled and unlabeled data. Then we'll talk about what is pseudo labeling actually is. Uh, some uh, use cases and some recipes of how, how to cook pseudo, label, pseudo, pseudo labels, and some example on the real Kaggle competitions where uh, pseudo labels were applied and achieved good results. So here is a general supervised learning problem. We want to have train and test uh, data, and for train data we are given a label, so have some kind of label data, and our goal is to build a model uh, to predict the test labels. So test is kind of unlabeled data. And generally it is a kind of usual Kaggle competition scheme where, where you are given some kind of labeled data and you need to make a model to predict on the unlabeled data. All right. And the problem we'll be talking uh, about today is a kind of a situation when there are lots of unlabeled data and labeled data is very small. So uh, this could happen to uh, both in your some kind of uh, usual machine learning projects and as well uh, on Kaggle competitions and uh, here probably you could uh, some kind of uh, create some tricky models to build uh, them on this small label data and apply some different techniques but probably the better approach is to somehow uh, use this uh, huge unlabeled data and the reasons uh, why uh, like why we have such situations when uh, the label data is very small the first one is it is expensive. So to label your data, you need to acquire some special people or you need to acquire domain experts uh, or use some special software in order to label your data and obtain label data. So consequently, uh, it is also time consuming. So uh, you need, for example, one month to uh, label one more batch of your data. And of course, your management will not be satisfied with, with this approach that you need too, too much time and you need to build a model right away. Uh, there are some other uh, reasons, uh, for example, there, there could be some sophisticated experiments. Uh, you need, for example, build some, uh, I don't know, uh, very, very hard experiments that's hard to establish and there are lots of, uh, lots of stochasticity in it and it is hard to, to uh, repeat it frequently. And that is why it, it is also could be expensive and time consuming. So it's kind of basic reasons why, why we have such situations with, with small label data. And here is a quote uh, by Andrew Inn that it is not who has the best algorithms that wins, it's who has the most data. And probably it is much more crucial uh, nowadays when uh, there are lots of machine learning models that are working out of box, so we could apply uh, and you could solve almost any problem type uh, just uh, using some, some, some predefined models. And the problem is that uh, you can't apply models when you don't, don't have data or uh, this, this label data is too small. So probably, uh, it could all it could also be extended for for the label data. So if if I have small label data, then it's also hard to, to build some kind of huge supervised supervised model. And in case if uh, you, you're unable to get more label data, and uh, if it, it is impossible or it, it's hard to acquire, we could use uh, the methods called semi-supervised learning. Uh, the idea here uh, I, I was introduced it in a simple example. Uh, here on the left we have a classic uh, supervised uh, supervised classification uh, problem where we have, for example, two classes, triangles and squares, and our goal is uh, to build a, a classifier, so a decision boundary that would distinguish these two classes. So here on the image B, uh, on the image B, we have some kind of uh, sample decision boundary between these two classes. What semi-supervised learning allows to do? It allows to uh, utilize also the unlabeled data. So this, this red dots uh, are some kind of, uh, we, we observe this data, but we don't, we don't have uh, the real labels. And actually from these red dots, we some kind of get uh, the structure of the data. And it allows to uh, some kind of change uh, our decision boundary, uh, uh, just using this knowledge. And we see that the decision boundary now is more, more reliable and more generalizable, probably. Uh, yeah, and what is actually pseudo labeling? So the labeling is kind of the simplest semi-supervised learning. So simplest supervised learning have, uh, has lots of different approaches, but pseudo labeling is like the most efficient and the, the most easy to use. And the idea is pretty straightforward. So 
we have a labeled data. We train uh, air model, like some supervised model, uh, on, on this labeled data. And afterwards, we just make the predictions on the unlabeled data. And actually, these predictions are already pseudo-labels. So we treat all the test observations that we have predicted uh, by our model as uh, pseudo-labels. And then we could some kind of concatenate these two data sets, so initial uh, label data, and our predictions made by our models, and treat all, all, all this data as a kind of uh, extended version of our label data and use these pseudo-labels in our subsequent training. Uh, yeah, before, before speaking on how, to look, how could we uh, utilize pseudo labels, I'll talk about some kind of couple of ingredients. Uh, the first one is confidence. So instead of taking uh, all the predictions from the whole test set, uh, we're interested only in the confident predictions. The reason for that is uh, if we uh, uh, add to our pseudo labels some observations uh, that are hard to predict or uh, some special cases, some corner cases, then it could like uh, uh, badly, badly affect our uh, our subsequent training because uh, uh, it, it, it introduces uh, some noise and s some bias in our in our model, and we need to choose only the confident to the labels in order to uh, like uh, select only the observations that our model is confident in. There are di dif different different definitions of, of what is a, uh, what is a confident uh, prediction for different types of, of the problems. So, for example, for classification problem, the easiest way is to kind of uh, take the probabilities for each class that were predicted. And for example, if at least one, one class have probability over 0.9, then okay, it is a reliable, reliable observation. We could add it in the confident pseudo labels. For image segmentation problems, for example, uh, we could use some kind of percentage of confident uh, pixels. So we, we, we're just uh, finding confident pixels on the image, and then we're treating uh, like the percentage of confident pixels, for example, over 80%. Then this uh, observation is confident. And uh, for the regression type of problems, it's a little bit tricky because it's hard to tell what is a kind of a confident uh, prediction for the regression problem. But one approach of uh, what, what you could use, for example, in deep learning problems is that you could uh, look at uh, your predictions from one epoch to another during your, your training of neural network, and if you see like uh, huge jumps from one epoch to another du du during the net neural network uh, training, it means that probably this this observation is unreliable, and it, it is not not a good idea to include it in the confident pseudo labels. And overall, uh, pseudo labels is kind of uh, the message that is widely used in the in, in the deep learning context. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, neural networks allows to uh, tra 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 train online, and you can add some new data to it and, and continue the training. Uh, so, but probably, uh, but, but not probably. So for sure, it could also be used for some classic machine learning problems, but it, 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 it is not, not so popular. So my, my talk will be more about, about some neural networks and the deep learning context. Uh, yeah, the second, the second gradient in, is ensembling. So instead of uh, creating uh, one, uh, one model and predicting one, one set of pseudo labels, we could train multiple models, then ensemble them in, in some way, and uh, obtain a new, new set of pseudo labels. The reason for using ensembling, uh, there are two, two uh, two, two different reasons. The first reason is that, of course, uh, it is better to use ensemble of models instead of uh, one model if you if you are talking about the quality. So, single model is al almost al al always be performs worse than, than ensemble of models. And the second reason for that is that uh, ensemble of models uh, allows to add diversity to our pseudo labels. So, if we, for example, using only a single model from one stage to another and continue training with a single model. Uh, then we could some kind of propagate the errors of, of, of this model. And if you are using the ensemble, then the diverse models could somehow eliminate this effect and we are obtaining more generalizable pseudo labels. Uh, all right, so uh, the first recipe how, how we could utilize uh, pseudo labels uh, called train simultaneously. Uh, so it consists of two steps. The first step is that we just uh, union two data sets, labeled data and pseudo labels obtained and treat it as a new label data. So of course you could, uh, uh, from pseudo labels, you could select only confident predictions or some kind of, uh, only some percentage, but we treat all, all the pseudo labels as, 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 a, uh, as, as a label. And afterwards, this new label data set could be used uh, to train a new model. 
So now instead of using original uh, 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 original label data, we use both uh, pseudo labels and train data and train a model. And it occurs that such approach allows to get better results than training with, with a single model. Uh, I mean, the, the model that, that was trained on uh, on label data. So concatenating. Uh, so one of the approaches is, is to concatenate uh, train data and pseudo labels. Uh, all right. Another approach uh, is called pre-train. It's a kind of a little different. Uh, in the, in the previous approach was based uh, some kind of uh, on a data level. So we concatenated uh, our data in the, sin in, the, in, the, in the single set of labels. Now we are, we are solving uh, some kind of a model level problem. So we, we take only pseudo labels, train the model only on, on the pseudo labels, and we obtain some kind of weights initialization. So we, we save the weights of this model that we have obtained. And these weights could be used as a starting point for subsequent train on, on, on the label data, on the initial label data. And the reason why, why it is working is that uh, afterwards, after you have trained uh, your model on the pseudo labels, now your weights are, uh, have, uh, know, know the information about your, your, your data set, about your domain you're working with, and this initialization works better than, for example, a common I ImageNet initialization. So, uh, the pipeline works in the following way. We have our pre-trained model that was trained only on pseudo labels. We initialize the weights, and it allows to train faster and obtain better results if we fine-tune this model on the label data, on the initial label data. And after we have fine-tuned this model, a new model, we could make predictions on the label data. And again, uh, this approach allows to get better results compared if we have started from, from here and just uh, uh, initialize, uh, initialize initialize the weights with the image net. Uh, OK, so uh, each recipe has some uh, herbs and, and spices. And here I'll talk about the validation of when we are talking about pseudo labels, because uh, pseudo labels is kind of uh, a, a, great, a great way to, to uh, 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 kind of overtune your model, and you, you, you uh, end up with overfitting to the leaderboard or overfitting to uh, validation data. And you need to establish the proper way how to compare the models before you have applied pseudo labels and after they have been applied. And for example, we have uh, these four, uh, four faults. So we're using basic k fault cross validation. And the first approach could be we just train four different models for each of the faults, assemble them, and obtain pseudo labels. And then these, then these pseudo labels are used in the first or second recipe in order to uh, continue, continue the training. However, uh, this approach is leaky because uh, we, we now uh, our pseudo labels data set uh, contains the information about all the all the tar 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 target variables, all the la labels in the trained data. And if, uh, for example, uh, after we, we implemented pseudo labels, we want to measure the quality on the, for example, force fault, uh, then it may occur that our uh, uh, our quality is too 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 too, too optimistic. Because our pseudo labels already have seen the labels of, the, of, the, this, of this first fault. So the better approach uh, is to use some kind of out of fault pseudo, pseudo labels. So for each fault, we train a separate, a separate model uh, and predict uh, and, and create a separate pseudo label that are trained independently. And afterwards, uh, it, it kind of provides a reliable, uh, reliable scheme of validation. So uh, then we can uh, compare the models. Uh, before, before pseudo levels, uh, and, 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 and after they have been applied, uh, the only drawback here is that we need to train uh, four different models for each fold and uh, obtain only one set of pseudo labels, and they're not, not really reliable because we need this kind of uh, ensemble ingredient when, when we are developing multiple diverse models. And actually, in, in practice, uh, everyone uses this scheme, this leaky scheme. So it is, it is le 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 less re reliable, because, uh, as, as I said, it is a little, uh, a little bit uh, leaky. But uh, the reason for, uh, for usage, usage of this scheme is that we, we are already obtained an ensemble of models. So we have, we have four folds, then we have four models. And if, for example, for each fold, we, we also developed three different architectures of, of neural network, then we have already 12 models. And it, it, is, it is really a great quality of pseudo labels, and it is really diverse. So yeah, stick, stick to, to this validation scheme. Uh, and now I'll talk about uh, a couple of examples where pseudo labels uh, showed pretty, pretty, pretty good results. 
And one of their uh, competitions is camera model identification. It was hosted uh, by Kaggle last year. And the problem was to uh, kind of classify uh, photos made by uh, some camera in, into the camera it, it, it was taken by. So it was a kind of multi-classification problem with 10 classes. And the classes are kind of Apple, Samsung, some, some kind of, uh, of other devices. And for example, this particular image was taken by, by uh, a, a HTC One. And yeah, it's kind of impossible to say it just looking by, by eyes. So uh, the neural net network approach have been applied here for this competition. And actually, in this competition, train and test data were uh, about the same size. So there were both about, I guess, 3,000 images. And uh, we remember that two the labels show great, great value when you have some kind of small, small label data set and large unlabeled data. But uh, the reason why pseudo labels are working here on this problem is this tra tra train and, and test fleet. Actually, all the train images were taken by a single physical device. So, for example, this, this green phone. Uh, but the test images, uh, for example, may, may be taken by, by the same model, for example, HTC or iPhone 4, uh, but they were taken by, by different physical devices, this, this orange one. And so the goal here was to some kind of use these test predictions uh, in terms of, of pseudo labels and probably it, it could uh, allow find us some particular features some particular uh, artifacts that are specific for this particular orange model and th that ca and they can be learned from the from the green model uh, okay here is kind of a recipe what, what have been applied and what what, what have worked for uh, for this particular competition so firstly uh, we are just making a kind of uh, classic classic approach. We train multiple models and sample them and sample them. So we could, for example, uh, try different architectures, different training procedures, and, and, and so on. So we obtain the labels, and this approach allows us to get 66 place on the on the private leaderboard. The next step is uh, could be a kind of we could take take these pseudo labels, pretend pre -train on them, and fine tune on train data, and it gives like a huge boost, and we we are, we are achieving. A top 20 position. However, as, as we've discussed, uh, their uh, like distribution between train and test data, it is probably the better idea to train only on pure pseudo labels. So the third step uh, is kind of uh, eliminates, eliminates the second one, and then instead of fine tuning on train data, we train our model on pure pseudo labels. So in this step, we, we don't use uh, the, the initial train data at, at all. And uh, in, in such case, it, it, it allows to get even better results and it achieves the seventh place on the private leaderboard. Uh, all right. Uh, the, next, the next example is salt identification challenge. Uh, it is, uh, the problem was Im 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 semantic image segmentation. So we were given uh, some kind of seismic images uh, of their, uh, uh, some kind of uh, 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 surface under Earth. And each pixel of the image was classified into two classes, whether it is salt or non-salt. And the goal was to build uh, a model that predicts the salt deposits, like some kind of mask, masks that are presented on the right. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in this case, in this competition, the train data contains only 4,000 4, images, and the test data uh, contains 18,000 images. So it's really a perfect candidate for, for pseudo-labeling when you have this, uh, su su such a large difference between labeled and uh, unlabeled data. And again, we start with a simple approach. We train multiple models, uh, obtain pseudo labels, and it gives, in this case, uh, the, the 46 position. It's pre pre pretty good. Uh, I guess uh, it was around 3,000 3, participants in, in this competition. And uh, on the second stage, we, we apply our second recipe. So we pretend the model on pseudo labels, fine tune on train, and obtain the, the, the place in top 10. And in order to achieve better results, we're just repeating this, this this, this two steps multiple times. So what, what does it mean? So after the sec second step, we obtain new set of we could obtain new set of pseudo labels. We, uh, we again uh, train multiple models, uh, obtain new pseudo labels, and also again pretend pseudo labels if we tune and train. So repeating this loop multiple times allows to get the better results and achieve to, to, top one position for this competition. And actually, the scheme uh, looks like a kind of in this way. So initially we have uh, only uh, labeled data. We train a model in this first round, then we predict pseudo labels on the unlabeled data. Select only confident ones and retrain the model. Then we repeat this, this test, for example, k times, 
and at each iteration we see the improvement in the score. So yeah, the, the, the scores improvement are kind of degrades, so they're, they're smaller and smaller, but each iteration uh, gives more, and more information about uh, pseudo labels, in, improves the quality of pseudo labels, and achieves the better results on, on the leaderboard. And actually one more idea that we're using here is that we're retraining the model. So at each stage, we're training the model from scratch. So what, what does it mean? Uh, if we're training, if we're going to train the model from the first stage, second, and third, and so on, uh, we could uh, finish with a situation when uh, our like error propagates through each iteration. So if we have made uh, an error in the first round and our pseudo labels are a little bit inaccurate, then this error will, will propagate through each round. So at each round, we just starting from image net weights and start start uh, start training models from scratch. Uh, okay. So yeah, basically, uh, there is no kind of universal universal recipe of how, how to cook pseudo labels and how, how they could, could be applied, because it's really very specific to uh, data you, 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 you're using and the, the problem type you're addressing. Uh, but you have some kind of building blocks that could be uh, uh, accompanied together with some kind of your uh, some, some spices uh, and, 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 and some ideas that could, that could improve uh, your performance, performance of your models. Uh, yes, this approach could be applied in both competitions and in real machine learning projects, and it really performs very well when you have a very small labeled da da data, data, data set, but unlabeled data is available kind of in, 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 in uh, yeah, so unlabeled, there are lots of unlabeled data. Uh, and when, when, when it, w w what is a good idea w w when to use this, the pseudo labels? It could be also applied in some kind of final stage of the competition when you kind of stuck with the ideas and your, your score does not approve. Uh, you could add, uh, try pseudo labels idea and probably it, it, it adds some kind of m m minor improvement at the final stage of the competition. Uh, so yeah, here is a kind of screenshots of where, where uh, uh, the winners of the competitions were using pseudo labels. They, they, they pretty recent, so they kind of two months ago, five months ago, a year ago. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a, a, a pretty common technique uh, in, in, in recent Kaggle deep learning competitions. And yeah, I, I guess it, it is a good idea to, 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 to give it a try. So thank you.